Thank you, Pastor, for your kind words and for your prayer. I don't know if I have too many, if any, greater friends than Grant and Tammy Etheridge, whom I dearly love. And I just want you to know it's an extreme honor for me to be standing in this pulpit tonight. And I love you both dearly. And Brian and Mary Smith, wherever in the world you are, if you're here, I love them. In fact, I recommended both of those brothers out of Arkansas and put them off on you to all of you. And uh, folks of Virginia bought that stuff I said, and they paid for it ever since. <laughs> but I love those brothers and the Lord, and what a joy it is for me to be here. Thank you, Brian, for the privilege to come to you. This state convention, this is an extremely unique state convention. If you don't believe that, follow me. <laughs> you should praise God for your leader who I thought gave a tremendous report tonight and to God's glory, we give him praise tonight. Now, Dr. K. Marshall Williams preached this afternoon. I, I told him, leaned over to him a while ago, and said, man, I heard you brought the house down. And I said, how in the world am I going to follow that? He said, oh, it was nothing more than a little fireside chat. <laughs> well, I better go get some more wood. <laughs> and that's why the Lord has sent me here tonight. Let me ask you this question. What is the number one need in the churches of Virginia? Is it revitalization? Is it becoming a sending church to plant churches throughout America and the world? Is it spiritual revival? Is it to update your music and contemporize the way you do ministry? Is the number one need to prioritize evangelism? Reach your city? What is the number one need in the churches of Virginia? I mean, you have a daunting task 11 million people in Virginia and Metro D.C. 70% of them, to our knowledge, do not know the Lord. That's seven and a half million that missiologists would tell you exist. And the task becomes even more daunting in America with 322 million Americans and three out of four do not know the Lord. And 7.28 billion people in the world. And we know that three billion are completely unengaged and completely unreached and another billion plus who are just nominally perhaps out there and some would tell you that perhaps there's a little over a billion, according to some missiologists, that would know the Lord the way we talk about knowing the Lord in the Word of God with a personal relationship with Christ. So your task is daunting. So what is the number one need in the churches of Virginia? All over this state and all over the country, we have churches that are drifting away from the mission of God. And when you drift away from the mission of God, you drift away from the power of God. Sadly and regrettably, pastors and churches are aggressively and contentedly moving away from God's power. I read about a lay person years ago in the 1800s that believed that he was failing miserably in the ministry that he had undertaken in his own church 
And that was a ministry to the immigrants in the neighborhood of his church. And after failing to complete and to achieve what he believed God wanted him to achieve, and he knew that he had failed miserably, he decided to call upon all of his friends to come and join him at noonday and pray. This man by the name of Jeremiah Lanfear called others to prayer at noonday. On September the 23rd, 1857, at noon, Lanfear was the only one to show up. But he faithfully began to pray, and before it was over, six other men had joined him. Within a month, a hundred businessmen joined him every day at noontime, calling out to God. Soon, thousands began to take their noonday in the city of New York and to pray and to call out to God. And just think what happened out of a population of 30 million people in America, over one million came to faith and trust in Christ in the revival of 1857 and 1858. I mean, could you imagine what that would look like in today's America with 322 Americans? And the move of God went across the Atlantic and another million came to Christ in Great Britain and Ireland and other places. The church was revived. The gospel was exploding and thousands were coming to the Lord Jesus Christ every week. Evangelism fire was raging across the nation. Would that not be great to happen again? And this great prayer revival and the work of God was felt for almost 40 years, not only here, but around the world. Missions were ignited in an unprecedented manner. And additionally, men of great renown like Dwight L. Moody, William Booth, and Charles Spurgeon were influenced profoundly by this great move of God. Jeremiah Lanfear was not content moving aimlessly away from the mission of God. So he prayed and he called out to God. And the power of God fell upon a man and a power of God fell upon a city and a power of God fell upon the nation and the power of God fell upon the world. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the number one need in the churches of Virginia, the power of God. We have too many pastors and too many churches that are contented to go forward to do ministry without the power of God. Did you hear that? We have too many pastors and churches that are contented to go forward and do ministry without the power of God. I mean, Satan has done a number on us. He has made us think that it's a lot more about the songs we sing and the clothes we wear and the personal freedom we experience than it is about the power of God in ministry. And the power of God in ministry is far more important than any and all of those things and more. As Southern Baptists, we are really big on spiritual conversion. And Southern Baptists will tell you that they believe that it takes a supernatural work of God to bring you to faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I mean, we really believe that. And boy, when it comes to conversion, we don't have any problem talking about the power of God. But once we get past conversion, 
You don't hear a lot about the power of God. We're too afraid. Or we don't know, or we're leery, we're uncertain, we're going to let others talk about it. Well, I want to tell you here tonight, I'm here to talk about the power of God because the power of God is our greatest hope in this world tonight. It's our number one need. Now, Brian, a moment ago, Autry set up my message perfectly. Thank you. If you have a copy of God's Word, I want you to look with me to the book of Acts tonight. And I hope that you will read along with me in a few passages that I'm going to bring our attention to. I want to tell you tonight, every one of these passages, you have probably preached on at least two or three out of the four. I'm not sure you've preached on one of them I'm going to talk about, but you should. One of them you could memorize or you memorized and you could say. We'd all get it messed up in the translations we memorized it by, but we could pretty well stumble through it. And I want to begin where he left off tonight. But I want to remind you that Jesus had been crucified. He had been buried for three days in a tomb. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. That began a 40-day journey throughout the land, talking to them about the kingdom of God. And right before he ascended to heaven on that 40th day after the resurrection, Jesus gathered everyone together and he gave to them the following words. Acts chapter one, verse number eight. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And following this epic moment, Jesus ascended to heaven. His 11 disciples and the people obeyed what he said. You go to Jerusalem and you wait there until you receive power from on high. Therefore, some 120 of them, we learn later, hung out together in an upper room, praying, fellowshipping, But we know that according to Scripture, completely united in prayer for 10 days in a row. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, these words. Have you ever preached on this? All these were continually united in prayer along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Oh, listen, for 10 days, they prayed. And in that 10-day period that they prayed, evidently the power was coming upon them, and then launch day came in On the day of Pentecost, and a preacher got up and preached after everyone had spoken in tongues and had shared the gospel in the known languages of the people that God had gathered there from all over that part of the world. And there they were speaking in those known languages that they did not know, but God had endowed them to speak in so that everyone could hear the gospel in their language and their dialect. And when Peter got up and preached, 
He must have given some kind of invitation because Luke said 3,000 of them came to Christ and were baptized. And the church was born. Acts chapter 114, Holman Christian Standard Version, all these were continually united in prayer. The New International Version, they were all joined together, being joined together constantly in prayer. The English Standard Version, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Listen to me carefully tonight. Continually united in prayer for 10 days with one mind. That means with one purpose, with one accord, in one passion, and having one agreement. This small band of believers using their own gifts, coming with their own personalities, all of a sudden were calling out to God individually, but together they sounded like a symphony under the ears of God because they were waiting for the power to come from on high. Well, what happened? Well, we know the story. The fire of the Holy Spirit came. The gospel was preached. 3,000 came to Christ. Everyone heard the gospel in their own language and in their own dialect. And before you know it, the gospel was being advanced across the planet to the glory of God. If you've heard me along the way in the last couple of years, I've said this. No great movement of God ever occurs that is not first preceded by the extraordinary prayer of God's people. It does not matter whether it's historical, doesn't matter whether it's biblical, there is no great movement of God that ever occurs that is not first preceded by the extraordinary prayer of God's people. Right here in Acts, what preceded Pentecost? Prayer. I wonder how much we want that kind of power. When I study this biblical account, it calls upon me and it calls upon you to embrace the power of God and pursue it for our life, pursue it for our family, pursue it for our church, pursue it for our ministry, pursue it for our future because prayer is the fuel that ignites the power of God in life and through ministry. Ian Bounds, a great writer on prayer, said these words, God shapes the world by prayer. How much do you want God to shape your life? He shapes your life. He shapes your ministry. He shapes your family. He shapes your church. He shapes your career. He shapes the future of this convention. By what? By the prayers of God's people. Why? Because there's no great movement of God that ever is preceded without the prayers, the extraordinary prayers of God's people. You see, there's something about Baptists that's quite unique in this, is that the vast majority of Baptists believe that we can get around that. We think we're exempt from that. I don't know if they, we think that means SBC or what, but that's not what it means. We're not exempt from that reality. None of us are. It doesn't matter whether you're a new church or the oldest church in Virginia. It doesn't matter whether you're a cool church or an uncool church, whatever that means. Shame on us. Whether we're a traditional or a non-traditional, shame on us. I want to say to us tonight, none of that really matters what matters is one thing, is God on your church? Or are you settling for what Satan will give you and keep you content and proud? Which one? It was in the first great awakening God raised up Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield to become spiritual catalysts, men who led the great calling out unto God that shook this nation before this nation even was. And the visible presence of God was shaking the colonies 
where entire communities were revolutionized by the power of God. Why is it okay to talk about that in the 1740s, but it's not okay to talk about it right now in 2015? I heard scholar J. Owen Orr say that in the Second Great Awakening, that was from 1792 to 1800, that the moving of God was so great upon the collegiate campuses that one-third of the student body at Yale University came to Christ. J. Menor went on to write and to state, out of the Second Great Awakening came the whole modern missionary movement and its societies. Out of it became the abolition of slavery, popular education, Bible societies, Sunday schools, and many social benefits accompanying this evangelistic drive. I want to tell you something tonight. It all came because of the power of God. Don't ever forget what I'm about to tell you tonight. Take it to your church and tell them this Sunday morning because some of them are dying out there and they need to know this. Some of them are about to walk out of a marriage and they don't need to. Some of them are about to go into surgery and they need to know that there's a God who can do something. Don't ever forget this. God can do more in a moment than you can ever do in a lifetime. And why in the world don't we practice ministry and live ministry and operate ministry like we believe that with our whole being? Virginia Baptist, I plead with you in Jesus' name tonight, refuse, refuse to go forward doing wonderful things without the power of God. Refuse to go forward without the power of God. Since the power of God is our number one need, in this state, in the states of this country, what is imperative for us to do and to operate in, in our life and in our ministry? What do we need? I'll tell you what we need. First of all, we need an unprecedented move of God like we have never seen before. An unprecedented move of God like we have never seen before. I mean, we're in a pretty grand church tonight. I mean, God's hands on this church. God's moving in this church. Bless his name. But wouldn't it be amazing that there was a move of God that could take this church and ascend this church three times what it is today? Five times what it is today. You say, well, that's not possible. Depends on how big your God is. Because he can do more in a moment than you can ever do in a lifetime. I want to challenge you tonight to understand that the number one need in America is a spiritual awakening and it will not come without the power of God upon the land. And I want to challenge you tonight to pray for the third great awakening in the United States. Some of you, you have put your whole future on who gets in the White House. I want to tell you tonight, I'm all for being involved I'm all for leading. I'm all for doing everything it takes. I'm not minimizing that one moment. But it's a lot more important for the church house to have God in it to the future of our nation than it is who happens to be in the White House. I don't know how many of these churches we have of the 600 plus in this state here tonight. But think about what would happen in this, in this state if every church in the state of Virginia 
would give one Sunday morning over the next year to giving the entire Sunday morning to prayer. Think about that. <laughs> what could God do? I mean, most of our prayer and worship is God bless this mess. Amen. Go. I mean, we take more time promoting events in church than we pray in church. Staff teams spend way much more time about what to communicate to the people than communicating to God. Jim Cimbala says, and he says it well, so many of you want prayer back in the public schools. He said, I would just like to see prayer back in the local church. You say, Pastor Ronnie, if I told my church that I was going to give the whole Sunday morning to prayer, they wouldn't come. Don't tell them. <laughs> Just don't tell them. You build it on the Word of God. You lay out there the principles of renewal or revival. You lead them in sessions of calling out to God, and they'll leave church thinking that's the greatest service they've been in, perhaps in years and some in their lifetime. You say, I don't believe you. Try it. I'll tell you why they'll like it, because they're not used to it. Some of us think that we're going to change our future of our church by something we say. I want to tell you, I've been where I'm at 29 years. There used to be a bunch of preachers hanging around a table, and they'd always say to me, they'd come up, Grant, Brian, and some other brothers, they'd come up and say, we'd be say, oh, Ronnie, they won't be long. You'd be out of here, and we'd all be here alone. Let me tell you something. I've been there 29 years. They're all gone or dead, and I'm still there. And I can tell you right now, there is little that Ronnie Floyd can say to transform Cross Church. But there is one moment where my God can show up and change it all. And he can do that in your church. And he can do it in your life. You really believe that, Ronnie? Absolutely, I believe it. I believe it on the authority of God's word. Acts chapter four, verse 31. And when they had prayed... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come on now. Mm-hmm. You on your feet for a song. How about being on your feet for Acts 4:31? And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Tell me what else there is about church than that. A shaking. You want a shaking? Where God shakes everything that is shakable? <laughs> That's kind of scary, isn't it? That beats death, though. That beats yawning during your own sermons. Are listening to sweet Betsy sing I'll Fly Away to you were praying to God she would. <laughs> oh, listen to me, church. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Could you imagine a bunch of, bunch of deacons getting filled with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and the preacher getting up and preaching filled with the Holy Spirit. And a choir singing filled with the Holy Spirit. Not about him, but being illustrations of it. And we spoke 
not about what was bad, but we spoke the only hope to this world, the word of God. That's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We need an unprecedented move of God like we have never seen before. That's one other thing we need. We need an urgency in our life and church like we have never had before. An urgency in our life and church like we have never had before. You see, the greatest difference, and I just preached through the book of Acts a couple of years ago. Took us, I don't know, almost 40 Sundays to do it. But you evaluate the book of Acts and you evaluate the church today and you say to me, Ronnie, what is the greatest difference between the church of of Acts and the church today? I'll tell you what it is. The church today has little to no urgency. The church of the New Testament was lit on fire by urgency. I mean, listen to me tonight. How do we move to a prompt life in the church and through the church and in our life and through our life? I tell you, it would not happen without a deep belief in the deed for urgency. I was thinking about this recently, so I wrote it down. I wonder why we don't have urgency. I've thought about this. I've evaluated this. Pastor Kay, I've prayed about this. But I think there are three reasons why we don't have urgency like we need it. First of all, we have a theological problem. You said, no, wait a minute, Pastor Ronnie, a theological problem? Well, we, well we, we got our theology more right today than ever before. Okay. There's only one problem, though. Pretty big problem to me, Pastor Brian. We don't believe in lostness anymore. We have a theological problem. We don't believe in lostness anymore. We believe if your hair gets gray enough, you go to heaven. Or if you got the right name tag, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, Bible boy, whatever it is. Oh, yeah, he's good. He's good. Good? There's none good. No, not one. A person is either lost or saved. And I'm telling you, we need to re-up on what we believe that it takes for someone to know the Lord and we need to fall in love with the gospel again. And when we fall in love with the gospel again, not just write about it, not just use cute language about it, but deeply believe in it, that it results in people coming to Christ or not, hell or heaven. Man, we need to believe people are lost again. We have a second problem. We have an eschatological problem. We don't believe Jesus is coming anymore. I don't know what happened, but we don't talk about it a lot. Every now and then you hear a song about it. But I mean, let me ask you, do you ever talk about the Lord coming to your people? Do you ever preach about it? I mean, do you preach about it with such conviction they fear to go home by themselves in case he comes and their family doesn't show up? Hmm? Are you just up there giving them all the ways you think it could work and how this has to happen and, and then you get all cute with all the language you were taught at seminary? Man, I'm for all that. Man, I got it all. I've been there, done that. I understand all that. But I'm talking about preaching with fire that you deeply believe with great conviction the Lord could come tonight. And you believe it so much that others believe in it. You, you know, we, we have a denomination that our baptisms are so bad. We, 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 have, we, we are at a deplorable low rate of baptisms in our denomination the worst since 1948. Harry Truman was in the White House. 
get some perspective. I wonder if our evangelism is so lame because our eschatology is even more lame. But I really believe this third problem is really the essence of what our, where we are. We have a spiritual problem. We don't believe we need to repent of sin anymore. We love our lukewarmness. We absolutely adore our apathy. We reward it and we bless it rather than condemn it and call upon repentance. Virginia Baptist, listen tonight. We really need to get real with ourselves. And we need to go back to our churches this Sunday and we need to call our church to repentance. You say, Pastor Ronnie, if I did that, I'd lose my job. So be it. You don't think some of us wouldn't lose our job? Oh, you got the big church. You think it's any easier? Somebody asked me not long ago, what's the difference between pastoring a big church and a small church? I'll tell you, there's only one difference I know. And I grew up in a church with 30 to 40, so don't talk to me about it. I don't know anything about it. But there's one difference between a big church and a small church. Bigger churches have more crazy people. That's it. That's the only thing I found. We need to call our churches to repentance. I mean, listen, because of the state of the nation, because of the state of Virginia, because of the state of the world, this is why our churches all across the convention need to give more money through the cooperative program. We need to put more missionaries on the field. We're bringing home six to 800 missionaries from across the land. That's got a story in and of itself. I'm not going there tonight, but I want to tell you something, man. When we start doing that and we start retreating in some mind, and I don't think that's a retreat. I think it's a reset, and I believe that's the heart of it. But listen to me today. When we try to retreat in our local church, Churches to not reaching our communities and not reaching America and not reaching the world. That is anti-New Testament. And we need to do everything we can to aggressively advance the gospel to the nations. Aggressively do it. This is why all of us that are Southern Baptists, we really ought to go to the SBC this year, this next June, 15, 16, 14, 15, excuse me, 1415 in St. Louis, Missouri. You say, I've never been. Don't know what that's about. You just need to come. Let you find out. But you ought to come. I mean, you really ought to come. I mean, listen to me. Look at it this way. Is your church give to the, do you, do you give to the Southern Baptist Convention? Sure you do. You give through the cooperative program or you give to Annie Armstrong. You give to Lottie Moon. Give to somebody. Listen. If I were sitting where you were sitting and I was an investor and I knew that we were calling people off the mission field, our baptisms were at a deplorable rate since 1948, 74% of our churches are plateaued or declining, I'd come and I'd check on my investment and say, what in the world is going on here? And I'll tell you what you'll find out. But the greatest need we're going to talk about this summer, awaken America, reach the world. That's what it's going to come down to. You tell me two greater priorities in this nation. Just because of what 2016 is about to unfold for this nation, we need to come together in St. Louis and call out to God together. I want to challenge you tonight to understand we're in real serious moments and real serious times. I close with this story tonight. I could go on and on, but you're done. In September of this year, I went to Massachusetts and I went to Vermont. On a Monday afternoon, I spoke to the pastors in the greater Boston area who were gathered and we dialogued together for 90 minutes 
Q&A type format. One third of our churches in the Northeast are in the greater Boston area. The vast majority of those are multilingual churches. And we dialogued together and then that night I went and spoke to a group of 200 Asian students at Harvard and we met there in the law school. It was quite sobering what I remembered as I walked in there to preach that night about how my English teacher told me that I would never amount to anything <laughs> and that I would never graduate from college, so don't go. And there I was walking in, and I was going to speak at the Harvard Law School to 200 Asians who were students of MIT and Harvard mostly, and half or more were working on their master's or their PhDs. It was interesting what they wanted me to talk about. They wanted me to talk about with them prayer and spiritual awakening. It was a grand moment. It was unbelievable, quite honestly. We went back to the hotel, and the next morning we got up early and we drove over to Vermont. And I went and spoke at a college for President Mark Ballard called the Northeastern Baptist College located in the state of Vermont. Now, President Ballard told me that Vermont, about 2% of Vermont knows the Lord according to the best of their knowledge. That's in America, by the way, if you don't know where it is. I went and spoke to that small Baptist college that's trying to become a light in the midst of a dark world. And after I spoke that day at chapel and I had lunch with a board of trustees, they were mentioning to me, you know, you, you know with your heart for awakening and prayer, you ought to go over to, to Williamstown, Massachusetts. That's the home of the Haystack prayer meeting. And so my wife and I and Two of my staff members got in a car driven by a professor, the librarian at Northeastern College, and he took us over there and he taught us all about the Haystack prayer meeting all the way over. And I already knew a lot about it, but he really taught me even more. It was extremely sobering that day because of what the story really is. The year was, listen carefully, 1806. There were five college students, all men, at Williams College, Williamstown, Massachusetts. They were meeting for prayer and to study William Carey's book on the inquiry to reach the heathen of the world. And all of a sudden, a torrential rainstorm occurred Thunder was raging and lightning was flaring all over the sky and they became scared for their lives and, and they looked for something to protect them and they saw a haystack that had been stored that if they could get under the haystack, they would be safe. Those five college boys ran and they got under that haystack and they began to call out to God in prayer as they studied on how to reach the heathen of the world. But they were in the deep midst of prayer and something happened that day. God came and met with them under a haystack. It was quite a moment because there was such a burden that was placed upon those men that day to reach the world. That a couple of years later, a group was formed called the Brethren, and all they did was gather together to study about prayer and missions. 1810, two years later than that, 
when these men graduated from college, some of them really believed that God wanted them to go around the world and they didn't have anybody to send them around the world. And all of a sudden, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions was created, which was the first official mission organization in the history of the United States. It's the very board that sent out Adoniram Judson and his wife, along with Luther Rice and many others. It became the father, Adoniram Judson was the father of Baptist foreign missions. And when you think about it, it all goes back to what happened under a haystack. And by the way, after they prayed on that hot afternoon in August of 1806, and when God came under the haystack as the rain was, was still going and they were leaving under the haystack, it was Samuel J. Mills Jr., a college boy whose daddy had been impacted by the Second Great Awakening and he grew up in it. He shouted out to those boys about reaching the world. We can do this if we will. Those men were changed forever. And historians will tell you that all mission organizations trace their history back to the Haystack prayer meeting in some way. Why? Because these men turned the world upside down. I want to remind you, college boys turned the world upside down all from under a haystack. We stood there that day, Grant and Tammy, and we looked at that monument. It was so sobering to me. At the very top of that monument, these words are written, the field is the world. Underneath that, it says, the birthplace of American foreign missions, 1806. And just think about it. It all happened in a prayer meeting. I believe God sent me here, Virginia Baptist, to give you a message. We need to get ourselves back under a haystack. Because the number one need in this state is the power of God. And we need to stop being contented living and operating in ministry without the power of God. And remember this when you go home. Remember this, Zach, when you go to D.C. and you drive back in and by the aura and the power of that city, remember what they said. This is what they said. The field is the world. We can do this if we will. You take every dream that was on those screens that Pastor Brian shared with you. Listen to me today. The field is the world and you can do this if you will. You take every dream you ever had in your heart, Grant, and any other pastor in this whole place tonight or anybody that watches this on podcast or watches it later on, I'm just telling you, listen to me, you take every dream you have and I'm telling you, God can do more in a moment than you can ever do in a lifetime because the field is the world and we, through God's power, can do this if we will. It's a matter of resolve and commitment and priority. I call you tonight back to believing in and living with and ministering with the power of God.